Thanks, Matt. Uh, well, first, I'd like to begin by extending a very warm welcome to everyone that's joining us for this Bars Digital event this evening on Dialogues and Receptions. Uh, as Matt mentioned uh, when well, he was talking just a moment ago, uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Mark Sandy. I'm editor of the Bars Review and I'm Professor of English um, at Durham um, University. Um, I'll say something briefly about the purpose behind the organisation of the Bars Digital Events more generally, of which this event, of course, is part of the series. And it was really intended to promote conversation and reciprocal exchange of ideas and a sense of community among scholars of Romanticism in what has been um, exceptionally challenging times and potentially isolating times um, for individuals too. And that broad aim of the digital events series is very much in keeping with the general aims of the British Association for Romantic Studies, um, uh, which was really looking to enable and support globally the study of romanticism broadly conceived um, in its multifarious manifestations. Um, just a couple of things before we turn uh, to one or two words of introduction about the, the, the theme um, of our event this evening um, on format or, or that the event will take and on Zoom housekeeping, as it were. Uh, we'll hear all four speakers' um, presentations first, and then we'll have a Q&A session at the end, starting at around about six o'clock, which should last 25 minutes or so. Um, questions from audience members uh, can be placed in the chat during the presentations or when prompted in the uh, open question forum after um, the papers. Uh, if you wish to uh, post a question in, in the chat box, please do um, indicate uh, with a capital Q at the start that it, that it is a question um, intended for consideration um, by um, the panel and I'm looking for a response, that would be great. Um, and just one other little bit of housekeeping um, on Zoom matters. Audience participants are reminded to have their cameras and mics turned off during uh, the presentations. Um, I'll say one or two things about sort of the topic, our theme this evening of dialogues and receptions. Uh, I think it's a really exciting area of romantic studies. It's one that's emerged as, as a burgeoning one um, of late. Um, and it's a theme topic area that's, that's come to the fore in a variety of, of interesting, I think, and fascinating contexts, which include British, European and transatlantic romanticisms, to name just about a few. Critics uh, have explored uh, these dialogues and exchanges of ideas within the Romantic period itself, as well as literary and cultural exchanges with Romanticism that cut across defined period boundaries. So explorations then of Romantic influence uh, and reception have equally questioned, I think, traditional notions of periodization. Uh, and they do so, I think, by showing how Romanticism responded to earlier literary and cultural influences as well as uh, examining the reception, both positive and negative, of Romanticism in later artistic practices, culture and thought. And, and I think that we're in for um, a real treat this evening because all four of the papers that we're going to hear from our speakers, um, with their varying degrees uh, of emphasis, uh, talk uh, to some of these concerns, the ways in which Romanticism itself has actively moulded and remoulded um, earlier cultures, thoughts and influences, but also the lasting um, influence um, uh, that Romanticism has exerted through its reception um, in later times, periods and modes of thought and art. So uh, without further ado then, uh, we should turn to our first uh, speaker, uh, who is Eleanor Booty. Uh, she is currently reading her MA degree um, in English Literature Studies at Durham University. Um, her master's dissertation uh, will focus on Milton's visual imagination and will be informed by eco-critical theory. Um, she is a graduate of the University of Dundee uh, with an MA uh, honours in English and Philosophy, uh, where she also published uh, an article on imaginative geography in Victorian literature in their undergraduate journal for humanities, ELLUS, and LA uh, plans in the future to pursue doctoral studies, uh, which will have a focus on environmental catastrophe and plague narratives. Um, uh, and she's interested in this sort of indices between eco-criticism and, and medical humanities, but that um, future research will have a very definite focus um, on literature and culture of the Romantic period. Her paper uh, this evening uh, is titled, They Saw and Shrieked and Died, 
artificial light and horrific sights in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and Barnes darkness. So I'll hand over to Eleanor. Thank you so much. Um, thank you everyone for having me here and thank you everyone who actually tuned in um, to join us this evening. Um, I will jump straight into it then. Um, so this talk will seek to uh, draw attention to the use of non-natural light uh, sources uh, as the marker for change in, perspective, um, in perspectives in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and Byron's poem Darkness. Uh, an eco-critical reading of these texts will be seen to offer insights into this crucial shift from passionate toil to that of paralyzing horror. This shift will moreover be seen as a movement from the anthropocentric to the ecocentric. This talk also draw heavily on the research and theories of Timothy Morton, in particular from his works, uh, Ecology Without Nature and Hyperobjects. So in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, Victor Frankenstein labors away, piecing together the body of his creature in a dark room, lit only by candles, um, as the dismal weather uh, blocks out the sun. But only at the mention of the half extinguished light of the dying candle does Mary Shelley allow her reader to see through Frankenstein's eyes. In doing so, we witness his own realization of what he has created. Similarly, uh, the post-apocalyptic narrative of Byron's darkness attempts to see beyond the life of the last human being by having the narrative voice of the poet depict us humanity's own extinction. The two survivors living in perpetual darkness create a pyre to allow them to see, but in the light of its flame, they witness each other and out of the horror of the sight of themselves, both die. The constraining in Frankenstein of that which is categorically human into an assemblage of body parts is like pointing to a mountain and trying to fit within it everything that is nature. Darkness equally has eco-critical uh, eco undercurrents um, as by creating the pyre, the two survivors see what they have become in the darkness reflected back at them in the other. Morton says that in the face of environmental degradation, we must sit with the darkness. And so this talk will illustrate precisely how these characters in these works uh, exist and resist um, the darkness, but are subsequently forced into a new horrific perspective of it through artificial light. I'll begin with a brief acknowledgement of the climate of the uh, 1816, when these texts were formulated. Um, 1816 is notoriously known as the year about summer. Following the 1815 uh, eruption of Mount Tambor in Indonesia, um, this eruption caused the uh, delayed but significant cooling of the mid latitudes of the northern hemisphere uh, for the following year. It was at this time that Shelley and Byron were visiting Geneva and uh, their stay was characterized by cloudy and dismal weather conditions and the sun was almost constantly obscured by the intense cloud cover. Therefore, they, uh, they were much more reliant on man-made light sources such as candles um, and it has been theorized that these weather conditions had an impact on the writer's representations of weather and landscapes and light in these works. So the dead and subsequently the undead appear to have a close relationship with artificial light. It is by the candlelight that um, Frankenstein imbues his creation with life and by the light of a constructive pyre that the two survivors of the environmental catastrophe in Byron's poem see each other and immediately die. Both scenes are characterized by a struggle against encroaching darkness. This is likely due to the low light conditions at the time, as I've mentioned, and speaks to the anecdotal nature of those uh, two writers' experiences of the year without summer. I went into the matter further in my dissertation. Um, however, for now, I shall focus on the importance of the presence of the darkness uh, in these scenes and in relation to what um, Morton calls the ambient category, that is the environment. Um, so the artificial light therefore expresses the inaccessibility of natural light sources, thereby amplifying the presence of the darkness. This pulls our attention towards the ambient surrounding nature of the darkness. So it is not so much an absence of light as it is a presence of darkness, um, as the sun is blotted out by the clouds and being constantly obscured. Uh, as such, the darkness is active and present and seemingly opaque, meaning that the man-made light sources are also active and thereby seemingly repelling the darkness. Natural light sources such as the sun appear uh, passive. However, the lightning of Frankenstein and the volcanic eruption at the beginning of darkness have particularly uh, interesting effects on the characters of the text. Though I do not have time to address them here in full, I would like to acknowledge their significance as potentially uh, deviant forms of light. Uh, so for, uh, further, uh, the artificial light seems to have a corrupting quality, unlike the natural light sources. And it is here that we witness the change of perspective that forms the crux of this argument. 
we shall see in uh, both texts uh, a shift from the anthropocentric to the ecocentric perspectives in the presence of artificial light. So Frankenstein pieces together his creature, and as he does so, he focuses on the value of its constitutive parts rather than regarding it as a whole body. It reads in a familiar passage, uh, his yellow skin scarcely covered the work of muscles and arteries beneath. His hair was of a lustrous black and flowing, his teeth of a pearly whiteness. Both these, uh, but these luxuriances only formed a more horrid contrast in, with his watery eyes that seemed almost of the same color as the dun white sockets in which they were set his shriveled complexion and straight black lips. The parataxis of this monologue shows that Frankenstein projects the idea of what is human in all of its uh, composite parts onto the creature. This is comparable to how one may uh, list aspects of their environment without at any point being able to encapsulate the whole of that which is nature within such a description. I cannot point to a mountain and say that is nature as much as I can point to a galvanized frog's leg twitching with electrical current and claim it's live. It's it is impossible to encapsulate everything that is nature in a mountain uh, because as Morton would describe it, it is hyper objective. Uh, Frankenstein attempts to do this, however, to the creature's body as if each organ is a mountain, as if he points at the eyes or the lips or the skin and claims each part to be the final piece of the jigsaw that completes the object that is categorically human. As such, the hyperobjective is considered as merely objective by Frankenstein through its anthropomorphism by pursuing nature to her hiding places. In doing so, Frankenstein brings together these composite parts, thus suggesting an inherent longing as all of the parts supposedly required uh, one another to make that which is human. There is a negative desire rather than a positive fulfillment. Uh, it is not one body to be given life, but a patchwork of many bodies. Only upon being imbued of life does Frankenstein see the parts as mere parts rather than representative of a valuable addition that will elevate his work to the category of human from dead materials. However, now in his success, it is a composite object unified by his labour. It is a literal anthropomorphic personification. Uh, this act of hubris, of hubris highlights the problems of anthropomorphizing nature as it denatures nature in Morton's words. He has reduced nature down from its hyperobjective state into the form and thus constraints of human temporality and space. The use of light in this scene is integral as Victor, having confined himself to this room twice removed from natural light, as it is blocked out by the heavy cloud cover and by now also by his reclusivity, um, his view, um, his views, he views his creation under the half extinguished flame of a candle. And I'm sure you're familiar with the passage, it was on a dreary night in November that I beheld the accomplishment of my toils. With an anxiety that almost amounted to agony, I collected the instruments of, my, of life around me that I might infuse a spark of being into the lifeless thing that lay at my feet. It was already one in the morning. The rain pattered dismally against the panes and my candle was nearly burnt out when by the glimmer of the half extinguished light, I saw the dull yellow eye of the creature open. It breathed hard and a convulsive motion agita agitated its limbs. One imagines the candle's constant light in contrast to the dismal landscape outside, but then in those intense flickers that occur just before a candle is finally extinguished, as it catches the pooling of the, of the oil, it seems that in those flashes between the encroaching darkness and the artificial light, that Frankenstein realizes the horrifying nature of his creation. Artificial light can thereby be seen to shift the perspective from, uh, from component to composite in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which appears to be allegorical to the uh, anthropocentric perspectives of nature versus uh, the ecocentric. For example, the acknowledgement of the differences in these time scales between the human and environmental or the physical scale when defining nature. Similarly, in Byron's poem, Darkness, the two final uh, survivors of the environmental catastrophe meet. Uh, in the darkness, they have no way of seeing each other until they construct a pyre, at which point, in the light of the man-made source, um, rather than sunlight, for example, they saw and shrieked and died. Upon seeing each other's gaunt faces under the glow of the pyre, it is through seeing their mutual hideousness that they die. In essence, they saw their own aspects reflected in the other, facilitated by the light they have created. To return to Morn's insights here, that instead of trying to get over grief, to shut out terrible, uh, the terrible trauma of um, current ecological crises, we simply stay with it. 
we can see that this, this is not the tact of Byron's last humans. Um, they were able to survive throughout the poem um, in the darkness. However, it was under the artificial light of the pyre that they died. Just as in Frankenstein, uh, there appears to be a shift from human timescales to ecological timescales. As in both instances, there appears to be uh, this circumventing of human demise. Man-made light sources can therefore be seen to reveal what was able to survive in the darkness, but also here represents a denial of current ecological catastrophe and humanity's subsequent extinction. It marks the shift from the anthropocentric to the ecocentric, as from this moment on in the poem, it is able to see past, uh, the poem is able to see past the life of the last human being. This brings its own artificiality insofar as this ecological augury attempts to see further than any human narrator can, as it, uh, as it is an apocalyptic narrative. Uh, Morton articulates this as remaining sighted after there is nothing left to see. So as such, the human capacity to exist in a time of environmental catastrophe is not merely tested by one's capability to survive such a threat, but now to document it. Recording ecological de devastation then appears to put the observer at a metaphorical distance to the event, uh, and it is the light of the pyre that marks this transition. The poem initially appears to use human frames of reference. A volcanic eruption is, is significant in relation to human timescales and the way in which we inhabit the world. However, on nature's timescale, here I am referring to uh, the concept of deep time in particular, uh, it seems almost as insignificant as a sneeze. Thus, the construction of the pyre and the death of the last humans forces us to confront the ecological perspective rather than the human, as there are no longer any humans left through which to experience the world. We naturally question the nature of the narrator, the disembodied form that appears to have documented the catastrophe, but also the reader. Who is this for? And to what audience does this narrator speak after the last humans are dead? This is why I propose that the artificial light in this poem marks a shift in perspective from the anthropocentric to the natural. To conclude, uh, it has been seen that non-natural sources of light show a struggle against environmental catastrophe a denial, uh, and a denial of the grief that is felt at ecological degradation. It also marks a shift from the anthropocentric to the environmental perspective, which is on a much larger scale, uh, spatially and temporally from that of the human. In Frankenstein, we have seen the constraining of nature into the human form, and in darkness, we have seen beyond the life of the last human. I hope this talk has been enlightening, if you pardon the pun, and I will have to welcome questions at the end. Thanks, Eleanor, for, for indeed a very illuminating uh, paper, if I may say so. Uh, and one I thought that really teased out the, the complexities of a darkness made visible by both Brown and and Mary Shelley to, to recognise this shift in perspective, as you say, between misconceptions of nature from the anthropocentric to the ecocentric um, view, a, a kind of radical rethinking of how we might um, find terms to express our understanding and relation with the natural world. Our uh, next speaker is uh, Vish Inigo Coffey. Uh, he was educated at the Universities of Cambridge and Exeter. He's currently a British postdoctoral fellow uh, based at, at Newcastle University. Uh, his first monograph, uh, Shelley's Broken World, is about to appear, in fact, very soon, 1st of July, with Liverpool uh, University Press. Uh, he's held uh, a number of library fellowships, one at the Hunston Library in 2018, uh, and a Fort Summer Junior Research Grant uh, was awarded to him by the Keith Shelley Society of America in 2021. And he's also going to one of my favourite libraries very soon, which is the Armstrong Browning Library, in 2022. Um, he's currently uh, working on uh, a project uh, related to uh, that of his uh, British Academy uh, Research Award, which is with Anna Mercer and Noah Cook, uh, putting the finishing touches to, as he puts it, the Frankenstein Review Shelley Notebook, a facsimile and diplomatic transcription, a manuscript 13290, which will appear with Bagnall University Press in association uh, with the Library of Congress. Um, but I think his paper today speaks perhaps to the heart of the British Academy project, uh, which is really about the reception, diffusion and editing of Percy Bysshe Shelley from 1851 to 1922. And his paper um, is titled Percy Bysshe Shelley and the Problem of Popularisation. So, Fish. 
Thank you very much. Um, and I think this is rather suitable, actually, because what I've done is I've actually changed the title of my paper slightly. Um, I don't know if that's come up. Can everybody see my slideshow now? Is that all good? There we go. All right. So my present research project, as Mark has just said, covers the important period in Shelleyan reception, uh, editing and diffusion, which begins with the death of Mary Shelley in 1851 and ends with the centenary of Shelley's death in 1922, a time of astonishing energy, criticism, textual scholarship, distinct editorial principles, a society with branches, anthologizing, memoirs, biographies, and genera of Shelleyolatry and Shelleyphobia. There were so many Shelleys on offer. We Shelley scholars and critics, however, have tended to tell a strangely simple story about this period. It goes something like this. While critics like Carlyle and Arnold stigmatized the poet as a wailing ghost and an ineffectual angel, self-serving adulators sanitized Shelley's reputation, obstructed his editors and frustrated genuine Shelleys, chartists, Marxists and socialists, one would think that so crass and crude a narrative would have been laughed out or overturned, but it holds fast and remains quite popular. Over the next three years, I hope to do something about that. This story persists in part because we like moments of hostility. They're attractive. And we sometimes forget that whilst a divided criticism spilled its ink, literature kept on doing what it does best. Shelley laces throughout the poetry of Tennyson, Browning, Swinburne, Thomas Hardy and D.H. Lawrence. His poetry inspired the Brontes. Leon and Sithner and Epipsicudion pulse beneath the agony of Jude the Obscure. He haunts the landscape of First World War poetry. Indeed, I can go on. We also forget the contributions of those who have been bluntly cast as impediments and there is a tendency to pump up only to moan and brood over comments with which we might have engaged with differently, perhaps productively. I believe the simple story is an impoverishment. As I cannot retell it all in 10 minutes, I invite you to look again with me at a controversial figure, Jane Lady Shelley and her husband, Sir Percy Florence Shelley, the Shelley's only surviving child. Often portrayed as domineering, sentimental, at times absurd, and unforgivably destructive of Shelley papers, Lady Shelley had her virtues too, and far from being some dope in tow who liked to mess about in boats and paint theatrical scenery, Sir Percy Florence collaborated with his wife. I shall end this paper by moving forward in time and review a couple of 20th century hostilities. Now, Lady Shelley is easily and frequently mocked, the figure of fun portrayed in Silver Norman's brilliant and diverting flight of the Skylark has proved almost indelible. We are familiar with the story of the bric-a-brac reliquy housed in a recess of her boudoir at Boscombe, the sanctum whereof the ceiling was painted with stars to which only the family was permitted entry, and how she organised the exhumation of Wollstonecraft and Godwin, which travelled by night, or whose bodies travelled by night to Bournemouth, where they now rest. Yet recent essays by Dr. Bruce Barker Benfield and Michael Rossington on the importance of Lady Shelley have begun a reassessment of her and Sir Percy Florence activities. Rossington has written powerfully in an essay titled Commemorating the Relic, the Beginnings of the Bodleian Shelley Collections, about the couple's wish to preserve Shelley's poetry and reputation, arguing that Lady Shelley followed Mary's own commitment to posterity. That is to say, the whole story of the Shelleys could not be told right away, but it would be preserved and gradually revealed to the public. This was not unique to Lady Shelley. Indeed, one of Shelley's greatest editors and biographers, William Michael Rossetti, agonizes over this question in some reminiscences. And what was the fear? Well, Bruce Barker Benfield puts it beautifully. People were still haunted by that paragon of frankness, William Godwin and his memoir. With her husband, Lady Shelley was committed to ensuring an audience for Shelley, and it was a partnership. They divided their labours. Here I should like, for a moment, to say a little more about him. 
It is sometimes thought that it was Lady Shelley who took the initiative to make contact with the Anthias Dale, Shelley's daughter by his first marriage. She conducted her to the sanctum and left her alone with the relics. The Anthe wept and finally realized what a noble soul her father had been. Yet Percy Florence, several years before her marriage, had, oh, sorry, his marriage, had made contact with his half-sister. He had sent a copy of Shelley's poetical works of 1839 to Ianthe Esdale with the following inscription, as you see here. Ianthe Esdale from her affectionate brother, Percy F. Shelley, March 23rd, 1844. And if you have a spare five grand, you'll be able to find it on, on Abe for sale. We are often told that they were conservative and promoted a safely depoliticized Shelley and so on. Yet it was Sir Percy who chose to publish Shelley's unorthodox essay on Christianity as an appendix to Lady Shelley's Shelley Memorials and who later gave permission for the publication of one of Shelley's more irreverent texts on the devil and devils. I had mentioned of somebody working on Milton earlier and of course this, this text is central to Empson's Milton's God, which appeared for the first time in the second volume of Harry Buxton Foreman's The Prose Works of Percy Bysshe Shelley, published in 1880. It was released to put Foreman through Richard Garnett, who would have had the permission of the Shelleys. As an example of where open-mindedness to what Lady Shelley has to offer is rewarding, I want to take the case of her copy of Thomas Jefferson Hogg's infamous Life of Shelley, published in 1858. On February 24th, 1857, she wrote to the publisher, Edward Moxon, who had visited the Shelleys at Boscombe, and he suggested that it was time for a biography of the poet. For Lady Shelley, quote, this is what she writes to him, the only person who could do this with a degree of truth is his early college friend, Jefferson Hogg. He won the job and set to work, and you know the story. Only two of a proposed four volumes were published. The Shelleys were furious with Hogg's portrait and pulled the plug. Tantalizingly, those remaining two volumes were written and lost, possibly destroyed. Here is the dedication from Lady Shelley's copy, and she makes her feelings clear. A work begun because of a college friendship ends a recent one, as you can see, the clear deletion of friend. I'd like to thank uh, uh, Elizabeth Denninger of, of the uh, Fortzheimer Collection for allowing me to share these images. Lady Shelley's meticulously marked copy offers wry counters to Hogg's portrayals. There are furious crossings out. There are touching justifications such as this. When at Oxford, it is suggested that Shelley's voice was shrill. Uh, and what does she say? Well, it's only because of puberty or because his voice was breaking. But what she go on to say, actually, there are counterexamples. His voice was gentle, modulated and so on. What is remarkable about it is that her disagreements coincide with the objections of many principled and still admired Shelleyans, such as Foreman and Rossetti. She cancels many of the portions in which Shelley is presented as a figure of physical fun, as clumsy or when, which could not be more untrue. Hogg claims Shelley could not understand Linnaeus or botany. I mean, <laughs> anyone who speaks about a polymath in that way, I mean, any, all of the recent work on his scientific uh, knowledge uh, uh, puts that to death. The period of my research stops in 1922, the year of Shelley's bicentenary, which coincides with the reaction against Romanticism that particularly impacted on Shelley's reputation. T.S. Eliot and F.R. Leavis are the two who are usually associated with the negative assessment of Shelley. Leavis in particular with the judgment that Shelley had a weak grasp upon the actual. Yet Eliot later in life also wrote one of the most admiring statements. Shelley was the one English poet of the 19th century who could even have begun to follow those footsteps. To whom did those footsteps belong? Dante. While Leavis, so far from telling students that Shelley was not worth reading, directed students away from the canon set up by Polgrave's Golden Treasury, the short lyrics, and pointed them toward reading a hard-edged Shelley, the Shelley who wrote The Mask of Anarchy and Peter Bell III. Late in life, in a little-known conversation, he admitted, quote, my Shelley essay may have been too extreme. 
It was written in reaction against Victorian adulation. Shelley was a genius. I may read him again. I insist on the right to contradict myself and so modify. Leavis showed his preparedness to subject himself to self-revaluation. We in turn now tend to sneer at Leavis where he's remembered at all. Reception history is about the endless work of recreation and revaluation. We inherit our prejudices, that is part of the process, but we must recognize them as such and so modify. Thank you very much. Thanks, Beige. That's great. I mean, uh, it's fascinating, I think, just to get that sort of really fine grained and nuanced understanding of the multiplicities and complexities involved in both Shelley's the, the hotly contested reputation, but also the varied ways in which he's been received and thought of. Uh, and wonderful to hear that uh, refutation of Levis um, of his own uh, earlier essay um, on Shelley. Thanks very much. Um, our next uh, speaker is uh, Octavia Cox. Uh, she is currently a tutor at the Department of Continuing Education at the University of Oxford and an honorary fellow at the University of Nottingham. She published uh, a, a, a number of peer-reviewed chapters and articles and has an article forthcoming in an issue of Romanticism in 2022 on reforming taste through Pope's celebrated moonlight scene. Southey, Coleridge and Wordsworth's A Night Piece, so we look forward to that. And she also has her first monograph um, forthcoming on Alexander Pope in the Romantic Age, uh, and I think that speaks very much to um, the topic of her presentation this evening. Uh, I have the title here, I mean, you may have changed it, as Hazlitt and Pope, so I hand over to you, Octavia. Thank you. Yes, it's still, it's still Hazlitt and Pope, um, but I will narrow it down a little bit as I go on. So William Hazlitt discusses Alexander Pope and the Lake Poets, especially William Wordsworth in his essay on Envy, included in The Plain Speaker from 1826. Hazlitt states bluntly, I do not think there is any point of sympathy between Pope and the Lake School. On the contrary, I know there is an, antip I know there is an antipathy between them. Today, I will outline two elements of Hazlitt's assessment of the Lake School's antipathy towards Pope. First, the problem of imitation. And second, the egotism of exclusionism in taste. The problem for Pope's reputation in the Romantic period, according to Hazlitt, was that he was too popular. His fame provoked pale imitations, which in turn reflected poorly on the original. Pope was far from alone in falling prey to overpopularity. Modern writers too suffered this fate. In The Spirit of the Age from 1825, Hazlitt opened his essay on Sir Walter Scott by asserting that Scott is undoubtedly the most popular writer of the age, yet Scott's legendary status has led others to imitate him. And in Hazlitt's contention, while Sir Walter may indeed surfeit us, his imitators make us. In the essay on Envy, Hazlitt's description of the damage the mimicry of insipid imitators had done to Scott's reputation, he had written, it is not the excellence of that fine writer that we are tired of or revolt at, but vapid imitations or catch penny repetitions of himself. And this serves well to explain Pope's fortunes at the hands of critics of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Pope himself does not tire or disgust, but the endless bland and mercenary repetitions and imitations of him certainly do. The very prevalence of such derivative efforts, Hazlitt believes, has an obvious tendency to lessen instead of increasing our admiration. It seems to be an evidence, he writes, that there is no difficulty in the task of producing opian poetry. This is to be regretted, since readers have not been used to look upon works of genius as of the fungus tribe, so like little mushrooms popping up everywhere. It is difficult to lend credence to a superiority of genius when it works without consciousness or effort, 
executes the labour of a life in a few weeks, writes faster than the public can read, and scatters the rich materials of thought and feeling like so much chaff. Genius thus conceived is no longer special, rare or otherworldly, instead it is diluted, quotidian, even common. As Hazlitt Northcote observes, on Envy is um, a dialogue stage between Hazlitt and the painter James Northcote. Imitators do all the mischief and bring real genius into disrepute. Pope's reputation was clouded by a surfeit of imitations, and this in some measure is an excuse for those who have endeavoured to disparage Pope. Poetry in the hands of a set of mechanic scribblers, as Hazlitt's Northcote explains, has become such a tame, mawkish thing that we could endure it no longer, and our impatience of the abuse of a good thing transferred itself to the original source, that is, Pope himself. It was, in effect, such a phenomenon of the transferal of indignation which enabled Wordsworth and the rest to raise up a new school or to attempt it on the ruins of Pope, because a race of writers had succeeded him without one particle of his wit, sense and delicacy, and the world were tired of their everlasting sing-song and namby-pamby. The term namby-pamby, meaning um, weak, insipid and unsophisticated, was the Scribblerus Club's nickname for the poet Ambrose Phillips. In the Dunciad Variorum from 1729, for instance, Pope had written that in Dunceland, Namby Pamby be preferred for wit. Northcote's, uh, Hazlitt's Northcote neatly summarises the perils imitation poses for a poet's legacy. I think a key part of understanding Pope's literary reputation in the Romantic period is to recognise how certain writers, especially as Hazlitt observes the Lake School, reacted not so much against Pope himself, but rather against the nauseous oversaturation of Popian poetry caused by the race of writers who had succeeded and imitated him. A particular pet peeve of Hazlitt's was what he called exclusionists in taste. Hazlitt observed that a bigoted and exclusive spirit is real blindness to all excellence but our own, or that of some particular school or sect. Uh, and this is a particular relation to uh, the Lake School and their envy Pope. For Hazlitt, such envy was not unnatural or malicious, that begins only with the natural limits of their own tastes and feelings. Indeed, the late school's antipathy towards Pope says more about them than it does him. It is not that they are unwilling to allow merit, but that they are unable to perceive it. He writes, Mr Wordsworth, Mr Coleridge and Mr Southey have no feeling for the excellence of Pope. They do not enter at all into his merits. And on that account, it is that they deny, prescribe and envy them, that is, Pope's merits. Hazlitt observes that incredulous odi is the explanation here. Incredulous odi meaning I disbelieve and therefore detest, from Horace's Ars Poetica. Hazlitt uses it with particular reference to Wordsworth, for whom gliding verse, brilliant diction and the fine turn of thought in Pope have no charms. Wordsworth has no faculty in his mind to which these qualities of poetry address themselves. Accordingly, Hazlitt does not consider Wordsworth's apparent distaste for Pope to arise from an oppressive, galling sense of Pope's merits, or a burning envy to rival them and shame that he cannot, which is what Hazlitt Northcote accuses them of but from the incommensurability of his understanding of poetry and that of Pope. Even if he could, Wordsworth would not write like Pope, Hazlitt argues, because he has no more ambition to write couplets like Pope than to turn a barrel organ. Hazlitt here plays on Samuel Taylor Coleridge's condemnation in the Biographia Literaria from 1817 that modern poetry has been mechanized into a barrel organ. 
This lack of sympathy in Pope's verse, this absence of ambition to emulate it, however, infects, Hazlitt suggests, Wordsworth's response to Pope in his literary criticism. He has no pleasure in such poetry, and therefore he has no patience with others that have. The enthusiasm that they feel and express on the subject seems an effect without a cause and puzzles and provokes the mind accordingly. Mr. Wordsworth in particular is narrower in his tastes than other people because he sees everything from a single and original point of view. Perhaps understandably, the singularity and originality of Wordsworth's own poetic perspective limits and narrows his appreciation for the poetry of others. Whatever does not fall in strictly with his understanding of good poetry, he accounts no better than a delusion or a play upon words. Samuel Johnson, in his Life of Pope from 1781, had declared, It is surely superfluous to answer the question that has once been asked whether Pope was a poet, otherwise than by asking in return, if Pope be not a poet, where is poetry to be found? The circumscribed poetry by definition will only show the narrowness of the definer, though a definition which shall exclude Pope will not easily be made. Hazlitt applies the same logic to literary commentators who are exclusionists in taste. That Wordsworth cannot appreciate Pope's poetry only shows the narrowness of Wordsworth. Hazlitt would go on to write unflinchingly in his article, The Exclusionists in Taste, published in the Atlas from the 26th of July, 1829, that we hate comparisons or the exclusive in matters of taste and reject, adjure and renounce all decisions and systems of criticism founded upon them. All this is mere depreciation and petty spite. It is running the downhill path of egotism and conceit. Some people are willing to give up Pope as being no poet, Hazlitt continues, while others laud and celebrate him. And what does this prove, Hazlitt asks? Surely not that there is some one thing in the world which we have found out to be good and that mankind are fools for admiring anything else, but that there is an endless variety of excellence nearly equal in different ways. If we had a sense, and that's a very popian term that Hazlitt draws on there, if we had but the sense and spirit to enter properly into it. Hazlitt had used the same diction on envy that I quoted earlier to describe the exclusionism of Mr. Wordsworth, Mr. Coleridge, and Mr. Southey, who do not enter at all into Pope's merits. Hazlitt accused the exclusionists in taste of acting on egotism and conceit. The ideal literary critic should conversely be an inclusionist in taste, but enter properly into variety with sense and spirit, should appreciate the excellences of both a Pope and a Wordsworth. I would close by making a further suggestion uh, that, Keats, that John Keats's Hazlittian idea of the poetical character being oppositional to the Wordsworthian and egotistical sublime aligns with Hazlitt's notion of the ideal critical character. In his famous letter to Richard Woodhouse on the 27th of October 1818, Keats wrote of the poetical character, and I'm sure we've all heard this a million times before, but why not a million and one times? It is not itself. It has no self. It is everything and nothing. It has no character. It enjoys light and shade. It lives in gusto, be it foul or fair, high or low, rich or poor, mean or elevated. It has as much delight in conceiving an Iago as an Imogen. What shocked the virtuous philosopher delights the chameleon poet. I would suggest that Keats's non-egotistical chameleon poet is rather like Hazlitt's inclusionist chameleon critic. Thank you. Thanks, Octavia. Uh, it was wonderful to hear. I mean, I, I love the idea that you know, Pope's 
was too popular in a way and that that was the downfall of somehow of his genius in in his romantic uh, reception and i love too the idea that you know the wordsworth and uh, college and others are responding not so much to pope himself but to his imitators and and, and that in some ways is very telling um that their lack of kind of negative capable empathy is their antipathy as it were is very telling in fact about their own kind of exclusivist um aesthetics and, and taste and i thought you brought that wonderfully um well to the fore there so thank you very much for that thank you um our uh, speaker number four our final speaker um of this session is daniela farkas uh she's uh, a first year student I don't know. She's a first year student uh, in the English department at uh, Pennsylvania State University. Uh, she's interested in some of the things I'm interested in too. I think I've always said I was a forward looking romanticist. She's interested in uh, modernist studies and the intersections between modern art and psychology as they developed alongside each other at the turn of the 20th century uh, in both Europe and the US. Uh, and she's also interested in how these um, ideas, the, these uh, germinations of, of psychology and art are reflected in myths and manifest themselves in subjective realities. And this has led her uh, to have an interest and focus um, on the work of William Blake and the American feminist uh, Ord Lord. And I'm sure we'll be hearing a bit more about that in just a moment. Uh, in the form, uh, she will be serving as a graduate assistant at the Hemingway Letters Project, which is housed at Penn State. And she will be teaching a course uh, on Latino studies. So uh, that will be uh, bringing all of your interests together, really, in, in many ways. Um, her paper today is titled, I Feel Therefore I Can Be Free, William Blake's and Audrey Lord's Concerns with the Body. So I hand over to you, Daniela. Thank you so much, Mark, for that wonderful introduction. So my paper is titled, I feel, therefore, I can be free, William Blake's and Audre Lorde's concerns with the body. And I want to begin with a quotation by Lorde that I think invokes the spirit of, of my talk today. So Lorde writes, the sharing of joy, whether physical, emotional, psychic, or intellectual, forms a bridge between the sharers, which can be the basis for understanding much of what is not shared between them and lessens the threat of their difference. The racial, cultural, temporal, and gender differences between William Blake, a white British romantic, and Audre Lorde, an American woman of color feminist, might appear unbridgeable. Yet in spite of everything the two don't share, there is one similar philosophical resonance that emerges in the work of both. They share an interest in resisting a tyrannical reason that manifests in social paradigms propagated by religious, academic, literary, and scientific institutions. This notion of reason is tyrannical because through an exclusive focus on the mind and intellect, it disparages the role of corporeality in mediating lived experiences and creating or structuring knowledge. Both Blake and Lord, in resisting capital R reason, identify the human body as the locus of one's liberation from oppressive regimes. By, put, by putting Blake in conversation with Lord, my aim is multifaceted. On the one hand, I seek to expand the reaches of Lord's intended audience, one which is almost exclusively female. I believe that her ideas regarding corporeality and self-sovereignty can apply to anyone. Further, I want to begin articulating the complex approaches that Blake and Lord engage when depicting the phenomenological significance of the human body. Both associate the body with sensuality, desire, creativity and imagination, spirituality, and freedom. For both, the body's role in structuring consciousness and experience by way of these associations is primary. They thus articulate how the body is directly related to everyday being. And in practical terms, they argue how a proper integration of body and mind results in a high quality of life. So I want to begin by um, outlining what each uh, identifies as tyranny or reason. And I'm looking specifically at Blake's The Marriage of Heaven and Hell and at two essays that Lord published in the late 1970s. Blake's marriage is among one of his most concise and accessible critiques of belief systems that sever the soul from the body. 
namely Christian Platonic traditions. Unique to the book is the allegiance Blake forms between the bodily and its constituents, desire, creativity, spirituality, freedom, and hell. In the marriage, capital E energy, the positive force that combats tyrannical reason, is celebrated in hell and wielded most pleasurably by its devils. Blake wages his argument against religious dogmas, like following the Ten Commandments or engaging in ascetic practices, as well as against intellectual histories of abstraction and disembodiment, both of which, for Blake, are oppressive. Consider his summation of human history, as it appears on this slide, one that begins with the ancient poets who once gave life to inanimate things, named them, and then created the deities through which human beings could structure their values. Blake writes that, eventually, a system was formed which some took advantage of and enslaved the vulgar by attempting to realize or abstract the mental deities from their objects. Thus began priesthood, choosing forms of worship from poetic tales. And at length they pronounced that the gods had ordered such things, Thus men forgot that all deities reside in the human breast. Blake rejects a subject-object division that, on a cosmic scale, resulted in the separation of soul, read God, or more generally divinity, from the human breast, that here serves as a synecdoche for the human body. The capital R reason that Blake resists in the marriage can further be connected to his contemporary milieu, in which empiricist paradigms of knowledge effectively resulted in what Nietzsche would later call the death of God. To quote Ann Meller, Blake's reason manifests itself as discursive reason or comprehension which operates through deductive or inductive processes to establish absolute laws of being, laws which can then be enacted as repressive social codes. Throughout the marriage, reason and its associations with tyranny and passive subservience are embodied by heaven's angels. In response to reason's exclusive command, energy, housed in the body and enabled by the body, is meant to repair the abstraction through which the subject was severed from its object and recover the union of soul and body, allegorized or paralleled in the book um, as the marriage between heaven and hell. Like Blake, Lord viewed reason, particularly in its racialized and institutional iterations, as oppressive. In her 1977, essay, Poetry is Not a Luxury, Lord identifies institutionalized racism and oppression with a white European literary tradition that emphasizes intellect, mind, at the expense of feeling, body. Reason for Lord is embodied by the quote, white fathers, who, by locating freedom in the disembodied mind's potential, consequently repress groups of people, namely women of color. And that term white fathers is, is the language that Lord uses. At least this is the story Lord tells. It is a story that rings true to the extent that white fathers represent a religious and intellectual history of oppressive abstraction. And this is a narrative echoed in Blake. But it is not true if white fathers functions as a metonymic phrase for literal white men. Blake's own rejection of tyrannical reason exemplifies the possible disjunctions between capital R reason and white male bodies. With her 1978 essay on the uses of the erotic, Lord articulates a comprehensive system for combating tyrannical paradigms in her theory of the erotic. Lord's erotic, like Blake's energy, is a dynamic and corporeal mode of existing that is meant to empower the subjects who embrace the phenomenology. It is specifically meant to arm the female subject against male models of power, and male models of power is another phrase that Lord uses. My interest here is not so much in Lord's gendering of oppressive regimes or resisting subjects, but rather in how her theory of empowerment defines one's body as the source of desire, creativity, and self-sovereignty, an alignment between liberation and body that, correspond with, that corresponds with Blake's. So now that I've briefly outlined a working idea of what Blake and Lord mean when they invoke tyranny, 
I want to begin illustrating what exactly uh, grants the human body its ability to resist tyranny. Both Blake and Lord identify the body, particularly its reunion with the soul, as the axes of human sexual desire. As such, integrating one's bodily desires gives one the ability to counter forms of self-repression authorized by ascetic and sex-negative paradigms. Thus, the marriage brims with poetic lines that emphasize the intimacy between the desiring body, pleasure, aesthetic beauty, goodness, and divinity. Like, quote, energy is eternal delight. Prudence is a rich, ugly old maid courted by incapacity. He who desires but acts not breeds pestilence. The lust of the goats is the bounty of God. The nakedness of woman is the work of God. And I've had to get rid of a couple phrases for the sake of time, but I could go on. Lord, like Blake, disparages an ascetic tradition of denying one's desires, aligning this tradition with fear as Blake aligns it with cowardice. Her thoughts on asceticism, as they appear on this slide, are preceded by her critique of the division of spirituality and eroticism. That, she argues, reduces, quote, the spiritual to a world of flattened affect, a world of the ascetic who aspires to feel nothing, close quote. Here, Lord condemns a perspective in which the spiritual and the erotic are incompatible, one that echoes Blake's rebuke of the subject-object division that abstracted mental deities from their objects. And I just want to clarify that neither Blake nor Lord advocate for a blind or belligerent um, sensuality. Uh, for both desire is ontological. And I think this is exactly why they interweave depictions of human desire with, with matters like spirituality. There is no reducing desire to, in the words of Lord, sensation without feeling. If I had more time, I would discuss how both Blake and Lord bind the body and desire with creativity and imagination. And I've included on this slide a couple excerpts from Lord um, that talk about how creative energy is part of the empowerment of woman. In the marriage, one of Blake's invocations of the relationship between the body, desire, creativity, imagination, and spirituality appears as Rintra, or divine wrath. The same associations amongst these themes are affirmed by Lord's words, quote, there is, for me, no difference between writing a good poem and moving into sunlight against the body of a woman I love, close quote. But instead, I will end by emphasizing the relationship between the empowered human body and agency or self-sovereignty. As Blake and Lord imply, an integrated human being is aware of their own corporeality and the demands, limitations, and possibilities of this embodiment. As such, a person whose soul or mind exists in union with their body wields a unique kind of power that, in the face of oppression, can guarantee their own freedom. At least, this is the ideal that Blake and Lord posit. My hope with this brief examination has been to begin thinking beyond categories that prevent thinking across differences. What is so interesting to me about the Blake and Lord affinity I've outlined here is how Blake's mythology does not at all align with the tyrannical white fathers Lord is, Lord is keen to oppose, and she opposes them with good reason. Rather, Blake is more akin to Lord's Black mother, Quote, the poet who whispers in our dreams, I feel, therefore, I can be free. Thank you. Thanks, Tanya. Oh, that was fascinating. I, I, really wonderful how you brought both Lord and, and Blake together and, and found you know, in Lord ways of articulating and uh, and of recovery for things that I think are always very complex and, 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 and deeply seated in Blake's um, mythology. And this sort of idea that in a way that they, they, they both offer a kind of critique of um, patriarchal models of, of, of power and want to reinstate and reassert the, the desire and energy and, and, and the corporeal again. Um, you know, a kind of resistance, I suppose, to sort of male models of the kind of mind forged manacles that Blake would have 
um, in, in, in the songs. Uh, you know, I thought it was very, very rich to bring them sort of, sort of from sort of different times and yet through that kind of conduit figure of Nietzsche as well, who I, I thought was very interestingly mentioned there um, in passing, that that sense of, the, of, of rethinking the kind of mind body uh, reason desire kind of duality and the very thing that both Blake and I, think, I guess Lord are, are pressing against is sort of uh, resisting simply seeing um, the world broken into those kinds of um, simplistic kind of dualities so thanks very much. Uh, of course Danielle was our um, final speaker so it, it is time to turn we have about 25 minutes or so um, for questions. I, I've seen that some questions have already come into the chat box, but I'd like to invite anyone else that would like to add um, a question at this point to, to do so. Um, if you'd just like to take a moment or two to do that. Um, uh, that's great. Um, I ideally would like um, to invite people that have put questions into the chat box and if um, all of our panellists, can, have they revealed themselves? I believe they have. Yes, good, excellent. Um, uh, if people that have uh, posed questions would like to also reveal themselves and uh, invite themselves by turn, by invitation to ask that question, that would, I think, be um, great. I know there was a question, I think, for Eleanor from, from Kitty Shaw earlier on. Is Kitty, would you like to? Would that be okay? Hi there. Hi, um, I just wanted to ask about um, in the very first paper, um, Eleanor was really interesting talking about some of the stuff that I work on too. Um, basically, the American uh, David E. Nye suggests that electric light, um, and I suppose by extension candlelight, are part of the American technological sublime. And do you think there's a connection between the idea that unnatural light is sublime and your reading of the unnatural light being corrupting? I thank you so much for the question. Um, it's certainly an interesting um, perspective. Uh, I It did remind me very much of the, the Burkean sublime insofar as like the, the terror that is um, associated with it. So I definitely think there's a reading of of it as being sublime, certainly. Um, I think I think I'm using corrupting insofar. It has a very negative um, connotation, naturally. Um, but I think I'm using it in terms of like a, a great word, conduit, a conduit for change or like a catalyst um, for change in order to bridge that gap between or invoke that switch between anthropocentric to ecocentric. So. I, I would definitely say that there is a link there, and I like that um, tether between um, the candle to the electric, especially with regards to the the American um, uh, Romantic movement. Um, certainly, I, I definitely think there's a lot to look into there, and I will definitely look into their work as well in order to inform my own research as well. Yeah, thank you. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, I, I, um, Anna Stevenson, I think you had a question for, for Bish. Would you like to make so uncloak yourself, as it were, and, and ask your question? I can't see you, Anna. Are you there? Sorry, my connection is a bit unstable. Uh, I managed no, to fine. unmute myself. Oh, no, don't worry, don't worry. Um, yes, yeah, so, especially because I was constantly reading on the topic today. So it's more to do with uh, Shelley's posthumous reputation. And we all know that, well, the Shelley's didn't really help with concealing and uh, censoring quite a bit of his more radical work and the perspective that people had of Shelley. So I was just curious, what's your view on the sense that if it was something initiated by the Shelleys and then taken over by people after that and critics and readers and so on, or if it's something that came together and it kind of just worked because of the values of the period in time that they were leaving? Oh, that's a, that's a great question, actually, because one of the things I, I, I sort of mentioned very briefly is that, of course, there, there is a sort of spectre in the room 
uh, when it came to, uh, you know, Lady Shelley and Sir Percy Florence, which was, and, and actually William Michael Rossetti talks about it as well, which is that Godwinian memoir of Wollstonecraft, which is that if you are a paragon of frankness and you say the whole story completely, there are muckrakers and nasty vinegary people around who will, you know, make of it what they will. Uh, and we saw that happen with, you know, John Cordy Jefferson's The Real Shelley, which was bloodshot, R8, nasty, uh, and dyspeptic to a, a shocking degree. So what, what I would say is I, I, I think that there was a pull at the time, particularly that 1851 uh, to say, I don't know, the peak of 1890s, where there was a division. Early Michael Rossetti says, let's have it all, let's have the truth, but sort of, don't, don't, you know, don't go on about it. That was his original strategy. But then, you know, in some reminiscences, he pulls it back and he says, ah, actually, there are some dodgy people out there. So I, I would say that actually what's interesting when it comes to the practices of biography and uh, exposure at that time is that there were multiple concerns and 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 also there were kinds of censorship as well uh, for progressives. So if you take somebody like Rossetti who wants to promote a radical uh, Republican Shelley, he doesn't quite like his early bawdy about his, you know, cuckolded father. So he pushes that out of the edition of his poetry. So it happens on both sides. And that's because I think Shelley, people get uniquely proprietorial about. Um, and so that opens all kinds of uh, avenues, but brilliant question. I don't know if that helps at all, but thank you. <laughs> No, it does. Thank you very much. I think it's something that I could actually ask further questions, but another time. <laughs> but thank you. That's great. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, uh, I believe, Gary Kelly, did you have a question for Octavia? If so, could you? Oh, there you are. Hi, Gary. Hi. Um, well, it was about the, um, it, it's about the history of the heroic couplet and the, and the blank verse uh, couplet and the, 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 the way in which uh, political differenti differentiations are shifted during, well, all the time, but <laughs> during the age of revolutions, uh, shifted from the political to the aesthetic and, and, and back the other way. So, so. It, it, it's curious to me to know um, uh, what you think about this this tradition, which I think was an actual existing one at the time, um, that uh, choice of verse form had implications, cultural and political implications that were well understood in the reading public that was addressed by those in that kind of market. Um, whereas <laughs> since that time, um, we've come to... Um, uh, we've come to, I guess, see the relationship differently. Sorry, I haven't articulated that very well, but that's that's my question for you. Yes. Okay. Um, so just before I answer it, I just want to add um, to what Bish was saying about um, the way that people choose. You can choose poems based on how they want to represent the author. That absolutely happens with Pope too. You get people who choose the Dunciad and um, how that represents the real Pope. And then you have others who choose, you know, Eloisa to Abelard, for example, and that is the real, real Pope. Um, so I think it probably happens uh, in all sort of um, anthologies and, and so on. Um, to get to get to the Back to the idea of the political and the aesthetic and how rhyme relates to the political and the aesthetic. Um, there's obviously, <laughs> there's a great deal to say, but just to boil it down, obviously Milton uh, talked about breaking the fetters of rhyme. And I think to some extent, a similar kind of, um, you might say, I suppose, pseudo um, psychological breaking the fetters of convention is applied to uh, Popian heroic couplets because in a way it's convenient it, it, you, the, that it's sort of 
part of the zeitgeist, I suppose, that you can tie in breaking the fetters of uh, rhyme with a kind of broader political point about breaking the fetters of society and, and so on. Um, and part of that, I think, is to do with the idea that uh, Coridge talks a lot about, which is the epigrammaticism of the heroic couplet and that it's too small and too little and too narrow and too confined. And it means that you can only say small parochial points and they're not connected in a broader sense. So therefore, um, any political points that you might make, if you make them in heroic couplets, can only be small parochial little points, um, et cetera, rather than, um, kind of broad, larger ideas that you might get with a different style. I mean, I don't think that's actually necessarily true. I think you can read, you know, verse paragraphs of Pope. You don't just have to read them couplet by couplet. Um, but again, I think it was kind of convenient um, to align those um, for the uh, for those at the time. And just quickly, the final point um, that applies also I think is and Hazlitt talks about this and Hunt talks about this as well which is that it sort of it re-became political the question of rhyme and appreciation of Pope and the heroic couplet because of the sides sort of taken by different reviews so the quarterly review for example Croker and um, those who generally speaking supported Pope um, that Hazlitt and Hunt complained that often those kinds of reviewers need to know the man before they can appreciate the poetry. And Pope sort of gets brought into this, um, and Pope in style poetry gets brought into a discussion that really doesn't necessarily have anything to do with him. It's just a way to um, be rude about um, Hunt and um, his circle and so on. Thanks, Octavia. Um, uh, Luke Walker, I think you have a question for uh, Daniela. If you could make yourself known to us and ask a question, that would be wonderful. Hi, uh, I've um, hi Luke. <laughs> I've unmuted, I think. Yeah, and, yes, uh, you've done it. Yeah, someone was not video, yeah. unmuting myself. Hi. <laughs> yeah, um, oh, actually, yeah, yeah, Daniela just um, just sent me a little uh, reply, and I I just sent her a reply to that as well. But um, yeah, I mean, if I, I was I was just I really loved the um, uh, the connection there between those two uh, two two poets, two subjects, and um, yeah, and taking Blake seriously as a as a kind of philosopher in in that context, um, and yeah, the you know it made me think about the way in which other um, poets of the of the period of of the nineteen sixties nineteen seventies uh, period. Um, uh, are also interested in in embodiment and in embodied sort of versions of Blake, but I, I, you know, just to sort of adapt my question a little bit, I'd, I'd also just be really interested to hear from Daniela how she came to to, to think about um, connecting Blake um, with uh, with Lord, um, if, if if she preferred to answer that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I'd love to. Um, you know, I. The I think the first time I really read Blake was in a graduate seminar, my second semester in grad school, and we read The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, and I was so taken by, by it. I mean, it was just this beautiful kind of proclamation of agency and desire and, um, you know, creativity and all the things that are just kind of wonderful. And I hadn't read Lord at that time, but I read Lord, I think maybe the same semester, no, actually like months, months later um, for another class. And we read uh, Poetry is Not a Luxury. And we read Lord in the context of a lot of, um, <laughs> a lot of kind of like these white male philosophers that Lord criticizes, um, Heidegger, Derrida and not like it's not like there's anything wrong with them but um it, it's just I it was just like the resonance between you know Blake and Lord was just so 
uh, it was just so sharp because uh, I think maybe in part because of the context in which I read Lord. Um, and I'm like, well, I'm going to take this up and I'm going to have fun with it. Um, I don't, you know, I don't think that there is an archival connection between Blake and Lord. Uh, there is one between um, Adrian Rich and Blake. And Adrian Rich sort of talks about, you know, she read Blake and she thought these were the greats. And then she sort of became exposed to like um, literature by people of color. Um, so she makes a case for, for um, sort of reading non-white figures. Um, so I, I think I just sort of had fun in intervening in this argument where you're kind of expected to read people of your tribe, um, to put it kind of crudely. So, so yeah. Thanks. That's great. Thank you. Thanks, Luke. Um, perhaps we'll stay with Blake for just a moment. I, I think Merv Actor has a question for Daniela as well. If you are there, perhaps you could make yourself. Oh, I'm here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Apologies. I'm not starting the video. Hello. And everything. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. But um, yeah, it's just that um, Daniela's talk really excited me and uh, Lord's essay on the erotic and about uh, sort of um, Lord's actually issue with the erotic as being miscategorized and mistreated uh, and that it is this essential creative life force within every individual. So um, that really resonated with me with uh, Lou Andrea Salome's The Erotic, which deals again with female desire in particular and how it's this essential sort of burning um, that leads to creativity rather than a death drive. So I, it was more of a comment and uh, uh, Daniela did respond to me privately. So I thank her for that. Uh, and I really, I guess I want to hear more about how uh, Daniela sees the relationship between uh, erotic desire, this sort of bodily desire, and um, this as sort of pitted against oppressive reason, if that makes sense. Is it a kind of methodology or is it like this stance? I guess I want to hear more about that because it's uh, really interesting. Um, because for me, to, uh, for me too, the romantic, uh, I apologize for this rambling question, but uh, this kind of the romantic uh, opposition against oppressive reason by asserting desire and especially female desire too uh, in the second generation romantic poets and even to a degree in William Blake. So I guess I want to hear more about how Daniela was thinking about this resistance against reason through desire and the bodily. Thank you, Murray. Um, yeah, I really appreciate your comments and your, uh, your reference. Now, I, I think that what happens with Blake is he, and what happens with Lord and what happens with other kind of women of color feminists when they talk about returning to the body is that they're trying to uh, articulate a way of being within the world. So perhaps methodology would be kind of too analytical. Um, it could be used as a methodology very strategically for like, you know, for reading or even for, for resisting forms of oppression. But I think essentially it's a way of being and experiencing um, and that, you know, interestingly enough is sort of what I'm still trying to articulate as clearly as I can, because I think it's the more, it's something that's, a, that's, that it's, it's fairly complicated. Um, and I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not in philosophy, I'm in English literature. Um, but yeah, I see it as a, as a way of being, and I hope that helps your question, your, your, your question. It does, thank you. Great, thanks, Daniela. Uh, I think we've probably got time for just one more question. Any questions that we haven't um, articulated in, in this form, we can pass on, of course, to the um, speakers. Um, Phil, Philander, did you have a question for uh, Octavia? 
Are you there? Hi, I've uh, managed to lose my picture. Oh, well, don't worry. So I do apologise. I'm now masquerading as an even more anonymous than I was before. <laughs> <laughs> so I, could, I suppose I've taken off the mask of death. Um, yes, well, it was a quick one, Octavia, really, about, uh, I suppose, terminology. Mm-hmm. I've been looking at the mask of anarchy, and uh, as we all tend to do in these days, and uh, I was intrigued by the the use of anarchy in Pope and anarchy in Shelley, and also possibly the uh, most pertinently to what you were talking about, possibly this idea of sense in Pope. If you would like to have a, give me a tiny bit more on that, I'd be delighted. I'd love to. Um, so sense, I mean, you know, it, Complete, what does Pope mean by sense? It's just the most enormous question. But Sorry, I narrowed in, it down. I was looking at the no, 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 dance in, he had, and uh, um, was not, in fact. But, but, but I think if I was going to distill it, what I would say um, in relation to the dance he has, and indeed across other Pope's other poems, is that it is fundamentally the opposite of illness, which is obviously crucial to the dance he And what is meant by... Uh, dullness are kind of the two extremes of sense. So on the one hand, you have Martin, Martin is scribblerous. So he's the kind of pedantic um, scholar of who does all the footnotes, etc. And that is judgment that is nonsensical, that um, is a useless kind of judgment. But then on the other extreme, it's you know, over emotion, it's not being able to control yourself at all and kind of relying too much on your senses and or letting go too much of your senses. Um, So really good sense, I think, you can boil down to the alignment of judgment and nature. And, you know, sense kind of has those two meanings of common sense, judgment, and the sense of nature. Um, And... In terms of the, you know, another person in the Romantic period who I think plays with this idea is um, Austen in uh, Sense and Sensibility when she draws out those two meanings of of sense, sensibility and sense. Um, And she even makes a mention of Pope in it when she says that um, Marianne likes Willoughby, Eleanor says, because uh, he admires Pope no more than is proper. Thanks, Thank you very much. That's great. Um, well, I'd like to draw things um, to, to a close. Uh, I mean, I'll just say one or two things. I think a more detailed and nuanced understanding of these various dramatic dialogues, influences and receptions enrich invariably our understanding of how we might reconsider the long 18th century and the long 19th century for that matter. I think it also helps us to really appreciate the variegated and persistent presence that Romanticism is and continues to be both in the 20th and also the 21st century. So uh, I think that sense of great richness of the um, uh, productivity and insight that comes from these um, renewed sense of Romantic dialogues, legacies and influences, as well as its later uh, reception. Um, I'd like to invite you, if you can, to unmask yourselves and, and perhaps we could try a round of applause for all of our speakers, all brilliant papers this evening. Uh, and I think it would be lovely to thank them all um, as much in person as we possibly can. Thanks, everyone.